Hey everyone, hopefully you're having a good day. My name's Andy, my channel is Finding Value. Today we're gonna go over some information on Twitter. Uh, I'm gonna go back and forth between charting and information that people are sharing. Uh, it seems to me that a lot of people are very bearish. Uh, they think a recession is coming and it's going to be somewhat soonish, 2023, first half, maybe even the second half, depending on who you're reading. But it seems like it's an overwhelmingly majority uh, bearish camp. Uh, we do have an inverted yield curve, uh, but I'm not entirely bearish as much as most of these other people. I think things can still happen between now and whenever an event comes, which means we could see a bunch of upside on, on things still, because generally what happens if you were to look through the progress of things is the Fed funds rate goes up. That's generally when oil, uranium, uh, all these different commodities from a liquidity cycle. So liquidity comes into the system, it creates inflation, and then the, F the, Fed, the Federal Reserve chases that inflation higher. It tries to, to slow it down through increasing of interest rates. And generally what happens is you get this increasing cycle, and it's been a pretty fast increasing cycle, faster than anything I've seen um, before. Then they're going to pause at some point, and that pause could be eight months or a year plus. It depends on how strong the market is. Now, here's, here's the problem. I think the market is way stronger than what most other people think. Why do I think that? Because we're in the middle of a housing, we're, we're in the middle of a housing boom where the interest rates went up so fast, it basically froze or stalled the market out. That, that's my opinion there. But when you're in the middle of a building construction cycle, you're in the strongest portion of the cycle. And yes, prices are coming off their highs. Completely understand. The affordability has been absolutely trashed with the increasing interest rates going to the level that they did in terms of the percent increase of interest rates. And that's really what pushed the affordability to a level I think people are struggling to afford with. Now, if you kind of take a step back and you kind of look at all the data, you say, okay, what if, what if we're in the middle of a construction boom? What would we see? And if we were stopping it, what would it look like? So uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of go back and forth. And I'm going to go across a couple of different ideas real quick here. So the first thing I was looking at and what brought this up was Scott posted the chart of Camco. Camco is breaking out of its trend line break, uh, and it's also a pattern. So we're breaking through this guy to the upside, and we just laid down a pretty fat, large green candlestick. Obviously, it says boom shakalaka. So the chartist guys, myself, Scott, whoever, uh, Casper, we get super excited when we break large trend lines, when we break things to the upside or downside, either one, and it, and it shows us potentially a clear direction. Uh, this broke to the upside, which makes us all bullish, uh, although it may have a pullback or whatever, a retest, it may not. But we broke to the upside and it looks really strong. Someone responded with, macro factors are too strong right now, no matter the fundamentals. We are stuck with correlation to the broader markets. Don't think this is a breakout. And, and that's where I'm like, all right, dude, we, we just broke out. <laughs> like It is a breakout. It is a breakout, period. There's no, there's, there's no denying that it broke out. The question is, is it sustainable? And then a lot of people think this is, this is the, by far the majority. Macro factors are too strong right now negatively. I don't think so. I do not think so. And this is why. So when we look at the housing starts, the housing starts is really where these cycles get heated up. This was the 1970s cycle for commodities. This was the mid 2000s, so 2001 to 2008. And then this is us right now. And to me, this looks very similar to this time frame right here in 2000, 2000 ish time frame. So think of it as a dot com bubble. And what's going on here, and the way that I would kind of ask anybody if you were to think of this, if you were to lower the interest rate, and you were to cut it in half, I'm just saying in general, if you were to cut it in half and you put it down to like a 3.5% mortgage rate or a 4% mortgage rate or something like that, would the housing market kick back on? In my opinion, undoubtedly, yes. I do think it would kick back on and people would start buying more homes. 
So the demand is there. This isn't a demand supply problem. It's an affordability interest rate problem, in my opinion, at this time right now. And I think that this is a pause. And I don't think the market can take interest rates this high for too long. So I do think that the interest rate will eventually work its way lower. And then I think the housing market will kick back on. Now, that, that's me speculating, uh, obviously. But what happened when the interest rate was low? We had housing kind of going ballistic on the price front. And then the housing starts tried to kick on. And right when it kicked on, and, and I think the Federal Reserve knows this, right when they started to kick this thing on and start to move to a level that's going to go on approach over 2 million, that is inflationary. And they did not want that to happen. So they had to raise interest rates very fast and basically freeze the housing market. They need to they need to basically slow that down because they put too much money into the system from the stimulus money. So this was one portion they had to really slow down. And this is obviously in the consumer price index as well. The problem that I have or that I ask everyone is, what's their second act? What are they going to do next? Are they going to lower? Are they going to lower uh, interest rates and then this gets kicked back on and we get inflation again? I think that's very highly likely. I also think that's why checkable deposits are so high is because people are saving for homes. They want to buy homes. That's one of the reasons why I think it's high. So I wanted to cover that. Um, obviously, if you want to follow me, it's at finding underscore finance. So let's go over some information on Twitter to give you my opinions here. It says the cycle guys are looking for precious metals down into mid-2023 with the rationale that the DXY will at least match its high near 115. Call me a gold bug. Call me ignorant to the nuanced field of cycle analysis. To me, this chart looks pretty clear. What he did is he just ran a trend line across coming down, and, and he threw a, another trend line in the middle of it. And it's like, hey, this thing is in a downtrend all the way basically from the beginning. So... Maybe we are at the upper end of this trend line and we could go back down to the bottom. If, if we do that, the DXY is going to get slaughtered. Uh, I do think that's the poss a possibility. So what the DXY is measuring is basically the uh, strength of each currency at the time, which is more or less the strength of interest rates and the monetary tightness. So we, we've seen looseness in Europe and Japan and all that stuff previously so we we basically tightened before everyone else and i think what's coming is that we are going to loosen at the time that everyone else is going to be tightening so that would be dxy weakness that is one um camp that you could that you could argue for which would be a positive for commodities here's one it says random but interesting at the goldman energy conference even when we get 100 180 million evs globally from 12 million now Oil demand won't drop much relative to growth. Need for oil to produce other materials or transport in growing population world mitigates the electric vehicle impact. Perfect. Now here's one. It says, uh, holy crap, remember that 3 million barrel to replenish the SPR the U.S. government had for auction? Government was unable to get a decent offer. The U.S. rejects oil offers in first attempt to replenish stockpiles. So a lot of people, they said, well, aren't they going to fill their their uh, SPR at $70 or lower. It's not going to happen, guys. They can't get 3 million barrels for $70 a barrel. No one's going to sell it to them. And here's another thing. The other thing is if they were to buy 3 million bar you know, 3 million barrels next month or if they were to buy any sort of volume, they would push the price to $200, $300 a barrel. The market can't take all of the demand in the market and these guys throwing on demand. Now, this is only 3 million barrels. It's not, it's not a huge amount. But if they try to do a million barrels a day for half a year, they couldn't do it. You'd push the price up to the moon. And, and the, re the, the way we got it down here is that they were releasing 1 million barrels per day, roughly, worldwide, to get the price down here. You can't go and have a 2 million barrel shift uh, releasing from 1 million barrels to uh, stockpiling a, a million barrels and have no detriment effect to the price. We're, way, we're in way too tight of a market. And remember, these, these extra barrels are what are pricing oil. 
oil would be at $150 a barrel if you were to suck out all of that commercial inventory and take it out. Be about $150. And I know they had numbers. Oh, it's like $4 a barrel or $7 a barrel. No, it's not. It's way more than that. Here's one. 10-year versus the three-month. Uh, when it goes negative, it is predicting bad news. You don't need to understand the why to recognize the pattern. And I don't, I, this is not the correct way of looking at this. And that's why I uh, shared this. In my opinion, it's not predicting anything. What, it, what this is showing is the market conditions. The 10 month divided by the three month and how this is going negative, because here's the zero line. Whenever it goes negative and inverts, it's just showing you that you're in an inflationary environment. It does not predict anything. Uh, it's, but I mean, obviously something bad could happen after this uninverts, but it doesn't mean that this doesn't continue to go down for another year or two. And everyone's looking at this saying, well, it's, it's inverted. It's going to crash. It's going to crash. Guys, it's got to uninvert. The crash has come when things uninvert. When it comes back down this way is when things crash. This is when it crashes. Notice that this is 2000 here, 2001. And then when it comes back, that's when you have a problem. So if we continue to invert, and let's say we invert another you know, year or two, maybe we don't. Maybe we come on back and then we come back uh, down again. Well, we'll have to find out. But it's just an indication of what the market conditions are. And yes, I'll, almost every time after this thing uninverts, we get a recession. Uh, it says, we have new developments in the bond market. The Japanese yen yield is rising, threatening the global carry trade. I think the yields on JPY and euro will take over the lead from the USD. If so, the USD will weaken, capping the current rally. Chart is of the 10-year uh, Japan JGB yield. And, it's, and it keeps going higher here. Look at this. Look at this move here. They said that they were going to try to hold it at about a half a percent, and it just went ballistic. <laughs> Uh, they're doing a bunch of QE. They're buying a bunch of bonds. This could be a problem. This could be a domino that that starts uh, in, in the system. This and Great Britain Pound, their uh, gilts. Here's uh, the tr this is so this is a log chart. Ten year Treasury it says the Treasury don't buy Fed hawkish view. The ISM manufacturing is contracting, and there's the. Um, the, the breakdown of yields. So this is a, just a simple trend line on logarithmic, and we're starting to break down, uh, and we could see lower yields. And remember, lower yields could mean that that curve starts to uninvert. It depends on how that, that curve moves, and the 10-year going down at a faster pace than the 30-year means that it's uninverted. Here's one. It says, loving this very big picture setup. Now against the blue gate, a uh, huge blue bullish falling wedge, huge bullish engulfing, and a bullish MACD crossover. Posted on platinum potential before called commodities bear market bottom back in April 2020. So this is for platinum. Platinum's looking really good. Uh, if you were to take a very big picture view uh, and you were to look at this, we've got a consolidation zone and another consolidation zone. We're about to break to the upside here. If we can close up at that like 11 something, 1150, 1200, we could see a massive move out of platinum. Last time the platinum moved from bottom to top is 207.6%. Uh, he took it from this same candles, the same um, projection. He has it from here, bottom to top. Uh, that puts us, I don't know, at like $4,000 platinum or something like that. A, a, a pretty, pretty ridiculous number. Uh, which is really good return for something as low risk as this. You can see the bullish MACD started to come up. Uh, looks really good. Uh, here's and uh, Andorand says oil may surpass 140 a barrel as Asia reopens. So Andorand says oil prices may exceed 140 a barrel this year if Asian economies fully reopen after COVID related lockdowns, according to hedge fund manager. So there's other guys that are thinking, man, this thing. We have way too tight of a market. Now, here's my question. If he thinks that 140 is possible with the, with the Asia reopen, there's no way that the government can come in here and refill their SPR. This is going to go push past 140, past 140. And if the government puts another 1 million, 
barrels on it, it's going to shoot it to the moon. They're not going to be able to replace their SPR. Uh, here's me posting. It says, uh, gold doing well. My boy Platy holding it down today. Uh, gold breaking out to the upside here. We had a little little ascending um, wedge going on, and we broke to the upside. Very strong there. We also have platinum. It had a little consolidation. Moving higher with the bullish engulfing that just formed last trading session. Very bullish for both of these metals. Lots of opportunity there, guys. Lots of opportunity for investment, uh, either in the physical metals or in those sectors. Uh, here's copper. Copper strong like bull. Uh, we had a nice strong move Friday, breaking out of this resistance line to the upside. We could see a big move out of copper. Now, all of the crash people, how is copper moving higher? Generally in crashes, you can see it here. This is the 2007-8 crash, the 2008 crash. Look at copper. It just it went into a basically a pattern right into the corner, and it just dove. It dropped like a rock. This is what what you see in a uh, recession, in a crashing type market, in a deleveraging type of event. I don't see copper doing that right now. We already had that that weakness out of the market here. Now, my question to everyone else is: Did we already have the recession, and is it over? Could that be a, a viewpoint? It's possible because you zoom in here and we're heading higher here off that support resistance line to the upside. And this is here is another breaking of a trend pattern here. This is a break to the upside for copper. So we broke up on copper. We broke up on uranium. We're breaking up on gold and silver and platinum. These are all inflationary measures. Is a is a is a inflation move coming? where the, the consumer price index could go higher based off of China doing stimulus in their system. I think it's entirely possible. And maybe they're the one running, running the show, not us. Uh, here's platinum futures closing at their highest level since March 2022. The breakout continues, 1109 there. It's looking strong, man. Uh, here's uranium. Could it be happening? CCJ breaking out. URA is about to break out. DNN doing the turtle head, just pop poking its head out a little bit. Uh, this looks entirely bullish, guys. We could see the beginning of a very big run in uranium. We just have to see some follow through now. And, and, and basically, we've got some individual companies that are already breaking their patterns to the upside. Camco's one. Uh, there's other ones as well that are smaller. And some of them, they've got uh, Livermore patterns. And the Livermore pattern, uh, if you were to kind of put this out, is basically right where we're at about to break and it's not just one company it's more than half of uranium has it so someone's lining this thing up uh, i'm in it definitely and i've i'm going to add more into this strength uh, I, I spoke with uselink there uh, it says construction labor market continues to loosen up keep an eye on this uh, so people are, are getting laid off in the construction area and I do think that we're in the middle of a construction boom. It's just delayed. The interest rates and affordability are delaying it. So we're going to see weakness until the interest rates come back down. U.S. petroleum inventories in million, millions of barrels straight on lower there. Uh, we went from 2.1 million barrels all the way down, or I should say 2,100 2, million barrels. Uh, we're at 1.6, a little under 1.6. 1,600, I should say. Here's another thing about protecting the downside. Saudi's not going to let Brent stay around 75 a barrel. That's Scott Sheffield. Oh, I like this quote. It says, during my personal line review, I realized I've been investing a ton of time, energy, and passion in something future me doesn't give a damn about. Huge realization and an instant shift in my attention. I do think that's kind of cool. Uh, it says, well, that explains today, Nat Gas, the Freeport LNG restart likely delayed by months, consultants say. I don't know why they keep trying to delay this. Um, they're trying to get approval. I think it's from something with the, the federal whatever, and they're not allowing to get it. Extensive personnel training requirements being implemented by federal regulators overseeing the facilities restart following a fire that led to its closure in June. That's how they're kind of slowing this thing down. And that does have a large impact on the price of natural gas. Here is uh, this, it says, good morning from Germany where housing markets has come to standstill. Monthly mortgage lending has collapsed by 40% in November year over year, representing a third negative record 
in a row since starts of the statistics in 2003. Mortgage volume dropped to 1.4 billion. You can see that it really dropped here. And I do think that the volumes is a precursor to what is to come in the housing market. Uh, I do think it's interest rate related, and we're going to have to see if interest rates stay up. Uh, if they stay up, then yeah, the housing market, we're going to have a recession and we'll, we'll come back down. This is for German, though. Uh, very important candlestick strength. You know, the, the big full candlestick, the green army, I call it. Strong, strong, and these are neutral to negative. This is um, bearish, bearish, and these are not really as bearish. <laughs> it says sellers were in control, but buyers rejected them. It's a reversal pattern. Uh, shale oil production is rolling over in the United States, and it may peak at lower levels than previously expected. Scott Sheffield, CEO of large U.S. shale company Pioneer, forecasts 2030 Permian oil production at 7 million barrels per day, down from prior forecasts of 8 million barrels. He says, yeah, we have the Permian about a year or two ago. I stated it was going to go to about 8 million barrels a day by 2030. Has it at 5.5 million barrels of oil per day? We have lowered that to about 7 million barrels by 2030. Uh, they are moving to tier two and tier three inventory. A lot of the companies it says the gas to oil ratios in the entire Permian Basin will continue to go up. We're seeing that you'll you'll see the percent oil drop for all those companies, most likely below 50 percent over the next 10 years. And that means that the fields are aging. That's what that means. Uh, here's XOP divided by the uh, West Texas Intermediate Crude, still incredibly cheap. Uh, this here is a bottoming pattern. You get a couple of, we'll call it a, a basing pattern, and then we've broken to the upside. This is telling us that XOP is going to outperform uh, West Texas Intermediate Crude, and we can see a large re uh, revaluation of XOP, which is the exploration production companies in relationship to crude oil. So that's looking good. Uh, here's this, income and expense, net interest income. This is the net interest income paying on all that debt. Uh, now, here's this is the bullish EAI data, total commercial petroleum stocks down 3.2 million barrels. And we're slightly undervalued on oil. Oil should be at about $81. Now, if you were to take the stocks and you were to really yank it down, uh, we would be at way higher levels. So if you look at the commercial inventory, this is the price here. This is your inventory. We, we went down over 200 million barrels. We would be off this chart way up here in the corner. We'd be at like $200 a barrel by using this chart. So um, that's what I've got there. Pioneer Natural CEO uh, tells us likely 100, 150 barrel for most of next coming years on China demand. Lack of spare OPEC pr production and declining growth rates in Permian. So the insiders are thinking we're going over 100, 150. For the next few years, other you know hedge fund guys think 150 plus. Uh, I don't really care necessarily what they think necessarily. Uh, it's mainly what I think. I think we're going higher. I think eighty dollars is far too low. 70s, 70s, 80s. Uh, I think we're going definitely over 100. I think we could probably go over 150 if the market gets a little bit too tight and it really has to kill a bunch of demand and we exceed the pumping capacity of the world. We could spike to a, a much higher level than even 150. He's got mega crap, to, uh, tech mega cap stocks year over year change going down 41%. Uh, so that's what we've got for today, guys. Just wanted to kind of share all of that. And if you guys like the content, give me a thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't. If you guys haven't checked out the website, finding-value.com, uh, platinum membership, use the word discount in the coupon code, and definitely uh, sign up there. We do have a platinum question and answer session uh, today, which is Saturday at 7 a.m. You could probably jump on if you want uh, and ask whatever questions for the platinum members. They can ask me whatever they want, and I'll give you my opinions on it. But uh, that's what I've got for today, guys. Uh, we'll catch you next time. This is Finding Value.